Amen. What a stirring beginning. Thank you, Ruth, for a wonderful prelude to begin today's worship. Look at you. I can see those smiles behind those masks. Really, with you, Chuck, I can see through that. And uh, so good to have you here today for our worship service. We welcome you for our 830 service. Of course, we're going out online as well, Facebook and YouTube. And so we want to welcome all those uh, who are uh, remaining home today and joining us in worship today. They are with us in spirit, and we appreciate each one of them so much and thank them for joining uh, in our worship today. Uh, each of our three sanctuary services today are right at capacity, so we are so thankful for that. And uh, as you know, we've moved our services to 30-minute increments so that we can uh, start services at 8.30, 9.30, and 10.30. And so we're exiting through this side door, as you're well aware of now. And I consider that, I really consider that my permission to go 15 minutes over with the sermon, right? Because we're not crossing in the hallways out there. No, of course I'm kidding, but it is a joy to have you in worship today and to join together uh, as, we, as we come to, to give thanks. And we begin today our second month of in-person worship after those three or four months that we were off. And so it's wonderful to be back with you. And we're doing that safely. Thank you for following all the rules, for keeping those masks, for maintaining distance. We appreciate that so, so very much. And so I welcome you, and now as we uh, continue with our service, Reverend Sheila will come to offer the call to worship and prayer time. Good morning. I will give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And that is a wonderful promise for us to continue to remember each and every day. I want to lift up some of our joys and concerns that are found in your uh, bulletin that you probably got online. I want to lift up that our sanctuary altar flowers are given to the glory of God by Richard and Connie Parrish in celebration of their 50th wedding anniversary. And also by Joel and Martha Howard in celebration of their 51st wedding anniversary. The Welcome Center flowers are given to the glory of God by Harry and Shirley Baldwin in celebration of their 67th wedding anniversary. Well, wonderful anniversaries to celebrate. We also want to extend our sympathy to Ginger Griffith on the death of her husband, Don. So continue to remember her and their family um, this week. As of right now, we don't have anybody in the hospital, so we're thankful for that and continued prayers for those who have gone home or gone to rehab. Um, we want to continue to think about them this week as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Creator God, we're thankful for this beautiful day that we share together. Each day is filled with signs of your love for us and for the rest of your creation. And we're grateful for your presence with us, and we offer our praise and worship to you today. Oh God, we know that you give us all that we could ever want or need. Forgive us when we chase after things that don't satisfy us the way that you do. Help us continue to see your blessings and to remember your great love for us. We continue to pray for our church community, the loved ones whose names we have mentioned, and others that we have on our hearts. They need your comfort as they experience illness and loss. We know that you are with them and we pray that they feel your presence each day. We continue to pray for our leaders as they make important decisions for all of us. It isn't an easy task for them. and We pray that they will let you lead them in the decision making. Our world is still going through such a difficult time and we ask that you continue to be with all of us as we live through the changes that we face each day. We lift up our prayers to you in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
got the call this morning. I can't believe he's really gone. I guess I thought he'd live forever. One more time, time proved me wrong. It was just a week ago I called him just to say hello And I'm reminded once again Life's a vapor in the wind Love the people that God gives you they're a gift that's heaven sent. Live and laugh and make some memories. Treasure every moment spent. It's none of us are here forever. That's a proven. Cause one day you'll want them back Each day the mirror tells the story I don't know where the time has gone The children gathered round the table Now have children of their own There may be things you need to say So while today is still today You have the chance to hold them close One more chance to let them know Love the people that God They're a gift that's heaven sent. Live and laugh and make some memories. Treasure every moment spent. Cause none of us are here forever. That's a proven. One day you want them back. Whoa, each day the list gets longer. Friends and family that I miss. When I think of things that matter most, it all comes down to this. None of us are here forever. That's a proven fact. Just love the people that God gives you. Cause one day you want them back. Love the people that God gives you. Cause one day. Thank you, Gary. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John. We'll be reading chapter 6, beginning with verse 22. Please stand as you are able for our Gospel reading. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. 
Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, what, why did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Even though you know the drill, I'm going to remind you one more time that we have offering baskets by the entryway and also over here by the chair rail. If you didn't put your offering in the basket on the way in, you may also put it there on the way out. Won't you be glad when things get back to normal? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you've given us so many wonderful things that make our life worth living. You give us the gift of family and friends, the gift of love, the gift of laughter. Most of all, loving Father, you give us your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life a ransom for us. Help us give this morning with a grateful heart as we return a portion of the blessings you have given to us. Lord, we ask that you use us and our tithes and offerings for your kingdom's work. Continue to bless us, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Since Reverend Sheila's message last week focused on the miracle of the feeding of the multitudes by Jesus, I thought it might be timely to follow up with uh, a passage from John chapter 6 recording the aftermath of that uh, miracle when Jesus speaks with a group of uh, believers who had come across the Sea of Galilee from Tiberias to, to uh, see him and to speak with him. And my focus is on verse 27. How many of you do get this? Some of you bring it with you? I can't wait for the day when we have bulletins back in here. I love to use the art and the pictures, as you know. 
But uh, you, if you get this online, do open it and look at it and, and bring it with you if you can. But the, verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Now, many of you work with food donation in our area. That's one of our key mission points at Christ of the Hills. In food donation, the key distinction is between perishables and non-perishables, right? And in our text, Jesus amplifies that contrast. And talk about a long shelf life. He offers bread that endures to eternal life. So pull up a chair. And let's feast on that bread this morning. And I say pull up a chair because in the the bulletin I've offered an image of a chair. Now it's hardly an impressive chair, but it is a very famous chair. It's an exquisite work of art. It's Van Gogh's chair. His famous drawing of his chair, which he made in 1888, it's now in the National Gallery at London. Some of you no doubt have seen the original. Van Gogh, you see, didn't merely look at this chair, this wobbly chair, and say, well, that's just an old chair. But let's be honest, that's what it is, that's what it looks like. It's a a piece hardly even worthy for the attic. But Van Gogh looked deeply. And he discovered a treasure within that chair. And his art captured that treasure in the imagination of any, conveying to any who were willing to look deeply. And so many millions have looked deeply into this painting. And they find a message. Behold the power of art. That old chair, looking so feeble and so frail, may have fetched only a few dollars at our garage sale, which we're not able to have this year, of course, but it would have been only a few bucks, I'm sure. But his drawing of that old chair is now worth an estimated $2.5 million. His art allows the chair to live beyond the wood fibers themselves that held it together. And it enables those who admire this work of art when they look deeply to see beyond the thing itself. Van Gogh's chair I'm using as an example of a Latin phrase with which I've titled this message. Ars longa vita brevis, which is this. Art is long, life is short. Art is long, life is short. Ars longa vita brevis. This phrase originated with the famous physician Hippocrates. He of the Hippocratic Oath, which is still a guiding set of principles for our physician community even today, even though Hippocrates was born nearly 500 years before Jesus. This line was part of his wisdom collection known as aphorisms. And in unpacking this simple saying, perhaps it would be good to begin with the obvious that while we are mortal, our journey, like that chair, is brief, dust to dust. There is something in our humanity which is of eternity, a creation of God, an image within us stamped on our souls that we can detect if we look deeply. And Paul called that a treasure within these clay jars. Vita brevis, life is short, yes. But if we look deeply, our eyes can detect the artwork of God, the treasure of God within these clay jars. The imago dei, the image of God painted with the brush of the divine. Our bodies may decay and perish, but something of us Long and lasting, that treasure within us, the artistic stroke of God. So if we feed, if we eat food to uh, sustain our bodies, what food, what sustenance will nourish that core of our being? That's the question I want us to ask today. I think that throughout human history, the food that lasts is art. Ars longa, art is long. By art, now I don't mean a painting or a sculpture, 
But human creativity in all of its forms, architecture, science, medicine, technology, literature, in these things we see the truth of the saying ars longa, Art is long. That's the human endeavor of Homo sapien. Through creating art, humans are imitating the divine image. This is why I often say that to imagine is to be on the periphery of God-likeness. What I mean by that is that we were created to be artists of the soul, producing something that lives beyond ourselves beyond the moment in which we live, producing something that outlasts our short shelf life, giving future generations something to build upon. Our ability to do this is art, and that is the echo of the creative impulse of God. In John chapter 6, Jesus calls attention to the short shelf life of the manna that God had sent in the wilderness the miracle of bread from heaven that rotted overnight, every night. And that's truly a short shelf life, sort of like the bananas on my counter, which I scramble to eat before they become unsightly and perish. By Jesus' time, manna was ancient history. But the story of the manna, the telling of the manna, the art of telling that story in the Passover Seder, the craft of telling, of writing, had lived through the centuries already more than a thousand years old before Jesus' time. Like Van Gogh's chair, that little bit of bread Jesus held in his hand that day that Sheila talked about last week wasn't much, wasn't worth much. But he urged the crowds to look deeper, to see far more than one meal. Jesus said to this group from Tiberias, you've come over here because I gave you a meal, but I want you to Search for the bread that lasts for eternal life. While that miracle was stunning, the inspiring message of the miracle has been conveyed through the millennia. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, Jesus said, and whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I give for the world is my flesh. So a bit of bread in his hand, worth very little in the marketplace, was transformed into a bread of life, feeding not only the multitudes in the Galilee that day, but the multitudes of the church throughout two millennia. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. Do not work for the food that perishes. And in a real sense, human art, our craft and our technology, is all about trying to beat back oblivion and delay it as long as we can. In 1795, Napoleon offered 12,000 francs to the one who could improve upon the prevailing food preservation methods of the time. Fifteen years later, the French chef Nicolas Francois Appert claimed the prize. He devised a method involving heating, boiling, and sealing food in airtight glass jars. It's the same basic technology still used in canning foods. Until that time, humans had used drying, fermenting, salting, pickling, storing in cold cellars, but none of those could adequately provide provisions for an army on the move through Europe. So Napoleon, as he prosecuted his wars against all of Europe, also fought a war against decay, against the inescapable reality of vita brevis, life is short. Now surely many of you have put up preserves of fruits and vegetables and so forth. If so, you are using pretty much the same technology that they discovered for Napoleon uh, hundreds of years ago. Ah, the mason jar with its flat lid and screw ring. It's an art. And to put up preserves is seeking the ars longa portion of that saying. The art is long portion to overcome the life is short portion. What is the making of preserves but the art of stalling time? To cook something is to prepare for its disappearance by devouring, right? But to put up something is to delay the demise. Making preserves is where an artist urges to put up something that lasts, meets a cook's desire for the momentary pleasures of the palate. These are the culinary arts. The culinary arts. Do we not wish we could put up as preserves the experiences that have filled our lives with meaning and with beauty. This is why I loved what uh, Gary sang so much.
that we could put up yesterday's evening sky, our vision of it over the lake or over the fairway, that we could put up a dance, a kiss, an embrace, that we could put up the voices of the departed loved ones so that we could hear them speak again, that we could put up a moment of wonder in an enchanted place far away from the stresses of our everyday living. And what are the photographic arts but the preserving of these moments, a thousand pictures lining the technological pantry of our lives. One of my favorite writers, Rebecca Solnit, whose art is long-lasting indeed and on my shelves, was diagnosed with breast cancer some years ago. And she wrote of how in the examinations she felt like she had been reduced to a bundle of vital statistics. Vita, vital. Vital statistics, vita brevis. Cancer was detected, and she tells of how that phrase took on a new meaning, that Latin phrase took on a new meaning. She wrote, of course I had always been mortal, I knew that, but not quite so emphatically so. A diagnosis will do that. It will cause us to look deeply at who we are and who others are. And when we look deeply, we discover in ourselves and in others a work of art produced by the hand of God and we recognize our own true worth and the worth of all from the feeble unborn in the womb to the frail aged passing through the womb into eternity. When we look deeply, we stir our imagination to detect the true worth of all living. Seminary professor Andrew Eddington wrote of returning home one Sunday night from a preaching engagement when he stopped at a roadside diner in Texas to snag a quick cup of coffee. He confesses that he needs a lot of sugar in his coffee. He had used all the packets on the table, and then he caught the waitress walking by and said, May I have a few more uh, sugar packets, please? And that crusty old gal who had been watching him pour all that sugar into the cup defiantly put her hand on one hip and she leaned over and she snapped, Stir what you got. If you ask me, that's what art is. To look deeply and stir what is within. Because life is short and art is long. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning, whether you are online now or whether here in the sanctuary. As you know, our ushers will be dismissing you from the front to the back so that we can come out this side door. And thank you for remembering that we need your registration each week, so don't forget to call on Monday early in the week because these services are filling up, and we appreciate you so much. Would you stand for the benediction and our dismissal? And now may the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose life was given for the life of the world, abide with you, so that when you look in your own hearts, you see something of great worth, and when you look into the eyes of others, you yet see the art of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>